Welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to call this video a masterclass video. However, this project is relatively new. I cannot tell you guys that I've been working this project for 10, 15, 20 years, like some of the other videos that we've already done. This species is brand new to us. We have only worked with these animals for about three years now, but we are making progress and I am super excited about it. And I wanna share all those updates with you guys and bring you guys up to speed. Let's get into it. So Antaresia, a genus of snakes native to Australia, West Papua, and Papua New Guinea. So these are known as spotted pythons or children's pythons, but they didn't get that name because they are small or the perfect snake for kids. One species was named in honor of John Children, who was a curator at the British Museum in London. So today's video is about a more recently discovered species which occurs in West Papua and Papua New Guinea, the Papuan spotted python. And if you are a regular viewer of this channel, you should be somewhat familiar with this one by now. Now this animal was previously known as Antaresia maculosa. However, last year, 2021, it was given species status after some in-depth study, DNA analysis, and that sort of thing. It is now known as Antaresia papuensis. So this species is believed to have a very small range and is only known from a small number of specimens found in two areas with similar habitat on the southern end of Papua and within only about 15 to 20 miles of each other, which would be Soda on the West Papua side and Weam on the PNG side. Now we believe this species only gets about three feet long and it appears to have a very calm demeanor. So for captive care and acclimation, all the information that I am providing you in this video is based on three specimens which I currently own. I received my three animals in September of 2019. The small group was comprised of a male and female pair of adults or young adults and one hatchling. The hatchling turned out to be female, so actually, in that particular situation, I got very lucky with a 1.2 trio. Now, while the baby was a cinch to get established, was feeding straight away right off the bat, both of the two adults were a little bit different. And I was very nervous because I knew that whatever I decided to do, all the decisions that I was making probably would affect the outcome of this species being established in the hobby. So my personal choice was to go very slow and very easy and take the least aggressive approach to addressing any issues that may arise. So the male was a good eater, that was not an issue, but he was covered in subdermal parasites. Usually these are just very simple to address. They're worms that live underneath the skin. They need to be manually removed and it's usually not a big deal because there's usually very few in number. This male was covered in them and they were very, very small. I wasn't even sure if I would have been able to see them to remove them at all. And we're talking about upwards of 50, between 50 and 100, that many intrusions into the skin to try to remove parasites would have caused a crazy amount of stress and I really didn't want to do it. Since I had experience with the subdermal parasites in the past, I knew that they wouldn't reproduce inside the host. I knew they were probably having very little effect on the animal itself and I knew that they wouldn't live forever and they eventually would die and disappear. I therefore decided not to treat the animal with any medication because that rarely works. Manual removal would have caused a massive amount of stress, so I just waited it out. And within about one year, all of those subdermal parasites disappeared and the animal was good to go. Now, it's my understanding that those particular parasites are in an intermediary stage in their life cycle. They do not reproduce in the host at that point, but yet they are counting on a predator to consume the animal that they are inside and they will reproduce at the next stage. So the adult female was an entirely different situation. She had no subdermal parasites but I couldn't get her to eat. And I tried everything. I tried scenting. I tried as many different prey items as you could think of. Nothing worked. However, she had amazing body weight and I actually suspected that she may have been gravid at the time of import. However, that proved to not be the case 
and eight months later, finally she took her first meal. And she was like no worse for wear, but that was a long, long time. But I was super patient, she looked good. And again, I didn't want to cause any stress by doing any sort of force feeding or assist feeding. Remember, this is an extremely rare project, one male and two females only, and I didn't want to lose the project by being too aggressive. So that was the approach that I took. She did start to feed for me and she never stopped. Now I did treat all three animals with flagellum panicure just as a precautionary measure for internal parasites. I did that in food. I did not want to cause any stress by doing any tubing or anything. Therefore, that female didn't get her parasite treatment until nine months after import. And in after two plus years of keeping these animals and raising them. The hatchling female is now almost a full grown adult. The animals are doing amazing. I have been keeping them in my CB80 tubs on cypress or coconut husk with a hide and a water bowl. I keep them very simple, 87 degree hotspot, bottom heat, controlled by a thermostat with a 10 degree nighttime drop. In the area that they come from, I know that there are not that many seasonal changes other than the amount of rain. So they have a rainy season and a drier season, but it still rains quite a lot. I chose not to cycle these animals, and I knew that it would take them probably quite a long time to acclimate to captivity, using that female as a prime example, taking eight months to feed. So everything was a bit slow on these guys, kind of slow and go. This is very unlike breeding captive bred pythons. And so I just chose to be very, very patient and not push the issue. So I did palpate that female for follicles throughout the year and never felt anything. And in December of 2020, we moved to Thailand. And rather than relinquish a super rare project to someone else, we decided to hold on to it. And I left those animals in the care of my mom. They were very docile, they were small, they were eating very good at that point. And I figured through frequent communication, I could just pretty much guide and provide her information and everything would be just fine. So my instructions to her were to feed them separately and then pair the adult male and female together. So they were together five days during the week. I had her do this every single week while we were gone. That way, because I wasn't there to actually see things that an experienced person would need to be seeing or feeling for follicles or any of the other breeding behavior, I figured we wouldn't miss any windows by pairing them every single week. We followed this protocol for all of 2021 and we had no results. It wasn't a big shocker to me because these animals needed time to acclimate. You can't just take animals and put them together and expect them to breed right away. It doesn't even really happen with captive bred animals to be honest with you, but this was totally different and I knew we still needed to be patient. Now, when we got home in the summer of 2021, I kind of assessed the animals, assessed the feeding, and all I did was increase the size of some of the meals to accommodate the size that they had put on. They were still small snakes, but they did fill out. And of course, the small hatchling female was growing quite rapidly. So I just stepped them all up and made some minor adjustments. And we left again in the end of November of 2021, back to Thailand again, and we continued on with the same protocol. Now in February, I was getting reports that the large female was not eating. And so I figured something was up at that point. And I asked that the male continue to be paired in between the meals, just in case. Now more weeks went by and the female was still off food. So I asked for some video and pictures to see if I could tell what was going on through those. So after I was sent pictures and video, I was pretty excited. I could see indications that things were going the right direction. I was getting feedback on how the animals were behaving and I was getting pretty damn excited at that point. So just as I had done the previous year, I had my incubator already dialed in at the right temperatures to incubate Python eggs. I had an egg box ready, everything was ready. It was only just unplugged. So in case we needed it, it just had to be plugged in and within minutes that incubator would be up to temperature. So after a few phone calls of assisting my mom in getting an egg box dialed in with the proper humidity levels and everything else, everything was set just in case. So being that it was already March, 
I was anticipating a pre-lay shed, but I knew from experience that that does not always happen. She had shed last in the early part of the year, and I was just thinking, okay, we have some more time. She's going to shed first and then lay eggs afterward. All of a sudden on March 23rd, I woke up in Thailand with the time difference, of course, and I had like 20 something messages on my phone. I had been sent a barrage of photos and videos. She had laid eggs. Now, I was told that the mother snake was very docile and easygoing. She allowed my mom to pull those eggs without showing any sort of defensive behavior. Very, very simple ordeal. And we were off to the races at that point and I was a really happy camper. So for those of you that are watching this video on the day of upload, we are currently on day 40. One egg was dimpled from the beginning and never filled out, and it sounds like we lost the one egg. It's not rotting out, it's not full of fungus or anything like that. It is just severely dimpled, but it is still in there and we're giving it a chance. I'm going to say seven viable eggs at this point. I have the incubator set at 87.5 degrees, and I'm assuming that the eggs will probably hatch on around day 50 or so. So again, as of the day of this video upload, we probably are looking at about 10 to 12 days further until they hatch. Now, I pre-recorded this video a few days ago. In fact, right now we should be on our very first day of a month long trip through Indonesia where we will be recording more content for you guys to see in the very near future. However, I hope to be able to check my messages at some point and get some good news while I'm gone, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to be thinking about it. I'm also going to be forgetting about it, I'm sure, because we're going to be so busy with stuff. But I will be sure and update you guys in June when we are back stateside. Hopefully, I'll be able to show you guys some babies. I was very nervous about doing a masterclass video on a project that I have not brought full circle yet, but it is what it is. You won't find this information anywhere else. And I wanted to get the information and the good news out to you. Big steps being made with the new Python species, Anteresia papuensis. So that is gonna do it for today's video. Cheer us on in the comments section, you guys. I'm super excited. Please cross your fingers for us. We will check messages when we are able to. As I said, we will be traveling. And that is about it. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe and we will see you in the next one. Take care.